Section 18 of Fantasy, Fairies and Ghosts by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bonbon, Part 2. In other respects, the Café de Bonbon might be said to differ little from the cafés of the period. A gigantic fireplace yawned opposite the door. On the right of the fireplace, an open cupboard displayed a formidable array of labelled bottles. There, Mousseau, Chambertin, Saint-Georges, Richebourg, Bordeaux, Margot, Aubryon, Lyonville, Medoc, Sauterne, Barac, Pregnac, Grave, Lafitte, and saint pere contended with many other names of lesser celebrity for the honour of being quaffed. From the ceiling, suspended by a chain of very long slender links, swung a fantastic iron lamp, throwing a hazy light over the room, and relieving in some measure the placidity of the scene. It was here, about twelve o'clock one night, during the severe winter of, that Pierre Bonbon, after having listened for some time to the comments of his neighbours upon his singular propensity, that Pierre Bonbon, I say, having turned them all out of his house, locked the door upon them with a sacre dieu, and betook himself in no very pacific mood to the comforts of a leather-bottomed armchair and a fire of blazing faggots. It was one of those terrific nights which are only met with once or twice during a century. The snow drifted down bodily in enormous masses, and the Café de Bonbon tottered to its very centre, with the floods of wind that rushing through the crannies in the wall and pouring impetuously down the chimney, shook awfully the curtains of the philosopher's bed and disorganised the economy of his pâté pans and papers. The huge folio sign that swung without, exposed to the fury of the tempest, creaked ominously and gave out a moaning sound from its stanchions of solid oak. I have said that it was in no very placid temper the metaphysician drew up his chair to its customary station by the hearth. Many circumstances of a perplexing nature had occurred during the day to disturb the serenity of his meditations. In attempting des oeufs à la princesse, he had unfortunately perpetrated an omelette à la reine. The discovery of a principle in ethics had been frustrated by the overturning of a stew, and last, not least, he had been thwarted in one of those admirable bargains which he at all times took such a special delight in bringing to a successful termination. But in the chafing of his mind at these unaccountable vicissitudes, there did not fail to be mingled a degree of that nervous anxiety which the fury of a boisterous night is so well calculated to produce. Whistling to his more immediate vicinity the large black water-dog we have spoken of before, and settling himself uneasily in his chair, he could not help casting a wary and unquiet eye towards those distant recesses of the apartment, whose inexorable shadows not even the red firelight itself could more than partially succeed in overcoming. Having completed a scrutiny whose exact purpose was perhaps unintelligible to himself, Bonbon drew closer to his seat, a small table covered with books and papers, and soon became absorbed in the task of retouching a voluminous manuscript intended for publication on the morrow. I am in no hurry, Monsieur Bonbon whispered a whining voice in the apartment. "'The devil!' ejaculated our hero, starting to his feet, overturning the table at his side, and staring around him in astonishment. "'Very true,' calmly replied the voice. "'Very true? What is very true? How came you here?' vociferated the metaphysician, as his eye fell upon something which lay stretched at full length upon the bed. I was saying, said the intruder, without attending to Bonbon's interrogatories, I was saying that I am not at all pushed for time, 
that the business upon which I took the liberty of calling is of no pressing importance. In short, that I can very well wait until you have finished your exposition. My exposition? There now, how do you know? How came you to understand that I was writing an exposition? Good God! Hush! replied the figure in a shrill undertone, and arising quickly from the bed, he made a single step towards our hero, while the iron lamp overhead swung convulsively back from his approach. The philosopher's amazement did not prevent a narrow scrutiny of the stranger's dress and appearance. The outlines of a figure, exceedingly lean, but much above the common height, were rendered minutely distinct by means of a faded suit of black cloth, which fitted tight to the skin, but was otherwise cut very much in the style of a century ago. These garments had evidently been intended a priori for a much shorter person than their present owner. His ankles and wrists were left naked for several inches. In his shoes, however, a pair of very brilliant buckles gave the lie to the extreme poverty implied by the other portions of his dress. His head was bare and entirely bald, with the exception of the hinder part, from which depended a queue of considerable length. A pair of green spectacles with side-glasses protected his eyes from the influence of the light, and at the same time prevented our hero from ascertaining either their colour or their confirmation. About the entire person there was no evidence of a shirt, but a white cravat, of filthy appearance, was tied with extreme precision around the throat, and the ends hanging down formally side by side gave, although I dare say unintentionally, the idea of an ecclesiastic. Indeed, many other points, both in his appearance and demeanour, might have very well sustained a conception of that nature. Over his left ear he carried, after the fashion of a modern clerk, an instrument resembling the stylus of the ancients. In a breast pocket of his coat appeared conspicuously a small black volume fastened with clasps of steel. This book, whether accidentally or not, was so turned outwardly from the person as to discover the words Rituel Catholique in white letters upon the back. His entire physiognomy was interestingly saturnine, even cadaverously pale. The forehead was lofty and deeply furrowed with the ridges of contemplation. The corners of the mouth were drawn down into an expression of the most submissive humility. There was also a clasping of the hands as he stepped towards our hero, a deep sigh, and altogether a look of such utter sanctity as could not have failed to be unequivocally prepossessing. Every shadow of anger faded from the countenance of the metaphysician, as, Having completed a satisfactory survey of his visitor's person, he shook him cordially by the hand and conducted him to a seat. There would, however, be a radical error in attributing this instantaneous transition of feeling in the philosopher to any one of those causes which might naturally be supposed to have had an influence. Indeed, Pierre Bonbon, from what I have been able to understand of his disposition, was of all men the least likely to be imposed upon by any speciousness of exterior deportment. It was impossible that so accurate an observer of men and things should have failed to discover, upon the moment, the real character of the personage who had thus intruded upon his hospitality. To say no more, the confirmation of his visitor's feet was sufficiently remarkable. There was a tremulous swelling in the hinder part of his breeches, and the vibration of his coat-tail was a palpable fact. Judge, then, with what feelings of satisfaction our hero found himself thrown, thus at once into the society of a, 
of a person for whom he had at all times entertained such unqualified respect. He was, however, too much of the diplomatist to let escape him any intimation of his suspicions, or rather, I should say, his certainty in regard to the true state of affairs. It was not his cue to appear at all conscious of the high honour he thus unexpectedly enjoyed, but by leading his guest into conversation, to elicit some important ethical ideas which might, in obtaining a place in his contemplated publication, enlighten the human race, and at the same time immortalise himself, ideas which, I should have added, his visitor's great age and well-known proficiency in the science of morals might very well have enabled him to afford. Actuated by these enlightened views, our hero bade the gentleman sit down, while he himself took occasion to throw some faggots upon the fire, and place upon the now re-established table some bottles of the powerful Vin de Mousseau. Having quickly contemplated these operations, he drew his chair vis-à-vis -vis to his companions, and waited until he should open the conversation. But plans, even the most skilfully matured, are often thwarted in the outset of their application, and the restaurateur found himself entirely nonplussed by the very first words of his visitor's speech. "'I see you know me, Bonbon,' said he. "'Ha, ha, ha! He, he, he! Hi, hi, hi! Ho, ho, ho! Hoo, hoo, hoo! And the devil!' dropping at once the sanctity of his demeanour, opened to its fullest extent a mouth from ear to ear, so as to display a set of jagged and fang-like teeth, and throwing back his head laughed long, loud, wickedly and uproariously, while the black dog, crouching down upon his haunches, joined lustily in the chorus, and the tabby-cat, flying off at a tangent, stood up on end and shrieked in the farthest corner of the apartment. Not so the philosopher. He was too much of a man of the world either to laugh like the dog, or by shrieks to betray the indecorous trepidation of the cat. It must be confessed, however, that he felt a little astonishment to see the white letters which formed the words Rituel Catholique on the book in his guest's pocket, momentarily changing both their colour and their import, and in a few seconds, in place of the original title, the words Regitre de Condam blaze forth in characters of red. This startling circumstance, when Bonbon replied to his visitor's remark, imparted to his manner an air of embarrassment which might not probably have otherwise been observable. "'Why, sir,' said the philosopher, why, sir, to speak sincerely, I believe you are, upon my word, the de, dest, that is to say, I think, I imagine, I have some faint, some very faint idea, of the remarkable honour, oh, ah, yes, very well, interrupted his majesty, say no more, I see how it is, and hereupon, Taking off his green spectacles, he wiped the glasses carefully with the sleeve of his coat and deposited them in his pocket. End of section 18